<coughs> Thanks a lot, uh, woman. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be chaired by a late German. It's uh, it's rare enough. <laughs> so um, I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers first. So I'm uh, Mathieu Le Tacon. I'm at the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology, and uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, my adventure with the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology started here in Natal four years ago uh, when uh, Hilbert, after this uh, visit of the, uh, this, this big cashew tree, uh, uh, came to me and said, well, would you be interested in uh, applying for the position uh, <laughs> as a successor there? And yeah, so four years after, I, I applied to the position and I got it, so I was very happy. And I think Natal is uh, always going to be a special place for me. So I'm going to... Uh <coughs> Uh, to talk to you about the uh, pressure control of uh, competing orders in uh, high-temperature superconductors. And I will first acknowledge uh, uh, the people who, who did uh, the, the actual work. Uh, uh, Michaela Suliu, who was my student in Stuttgart and uh, was in a did a postdoc at the SRF and now is back uh, in, in Karlsruhe uh, with me. And uh, Huno Kim, uh, who is a PhD student in the group of Bernard Keimer did his master thesis with me and uh, I kept on uh, exploiting him a bit uh, uh, even when I, when I left Karlsruhe. Uh, and Clifford Hicks, uh, who is a senior scientist in the group of uh, Andy McKenzie and Max Planck in Dresden, who developed uh, these uh, uh, unique shell pressure cells that I'm going to, to talk to you about today. Um, so the phase diagram of uh, high temperature superconducting cuprates is, uh, is known to, uh, to most of you, I guess, and it was shown already a couple of times in, in that conference. We know that you have the antiferromagnetic phase, you suppress the antiferromagnetic order upon doping, uh, and there's this uh, superconducting dome that appears uh, with a maximum TC around 16%. Uh, and uh, what we discovered a few years back, I'm going to, to show this a bit more on this, is that there was a, a charge ordered phase in the so called, um, under the so called pseudo gap uh, uh, crossover or transition line, P star. Uh, and this charge order, of course, uh, was we, we found it to be strongly competing with superconductivity and uh, still the, the interplay, the precise interplay and, and the nature of the interaction between superconductivity and charge order remains a bit uh, mysterious. But there's a second phase diagram, uh, which is what happens uh, when you uh, put a magnetic field. And it was recently found, uh, so we heard uh, from Baptiste about the Fermi surface reconstructions, about the quantum oscillations, and uh, this kind of thing. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but uh, from the X-ray perspective or from the structural point of view, uh, it was found that above a certain magnetic field, uh, uh, around something like 15 Tesla, and instead of this uh, 2D charge order that we see here in the absence of magnetic field, there's a new 3D charge order that sets in, a really long-range charge order when superconductivity is suppressed, and the relationship between the 2D and the 3D charge order uh, is, is, is also something we would like to understand better and maybe to get, as we listen to link, some uh, insight regarding the microscopic mechanism uh, yielding the, the formation of the, of the, of the charge density wave. So, um, I start first with the, uh, the, the charge density wave uh, without the field, which historically was found uh, uh, after the one in the high field, but uh, we found it a bit by accident, so this is resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, so this is a spectroscopic method that we use to study the spin excitations, and what we notice is that the elastic line here that corresponds to the zero energy loss uh, measured here as different uh, momentum transfer had a maximum at somewhere in the middle of the, of the gamma x uh, direction. And um, to make a long story short, if you, make a, uh, if you translate that into reciprocal stress picture, you find that there are two uh, sets of satellites uh, with different uh, correlation lengths uh, that corresponds to a supermodulation uh, of the underlying lattice. Uh, and uh, so basically it's, it's, a, it's an incommensurate uh, charge density wave, so the it's picked around 0 0.31 here, a uh, relative uh, reciprocal lattice unit, and it corresponds, and it, it is a bi shell, so it's seen both along the A and the B direction. And so the, the unit cell, um, the superstructure is roughly three unit cell large, but it's, it's over incom incommensurate. The maximum correlation length that you obtain are not terrifically large. I mean, you get to something like 60 to, uh, to 80 angstrom. Uh, so the question whether it's an actual order, a short range order, or if these are some kind of pinned uh, long range fluctuations was, was uh, asked from the beginning. Uh, and there are other interesting facts. 
So for instance, the incommensurability has a strong doping dependence, which is opposite to that of, of, of the stripe. So in the case of YBCO, and also in the case of BISCO and mercury-based compound, the incommensurability increases as you decrease the doping level and go towards uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the mud insulating phase. Whereas in the case of stripes in the, in the 214 cuprates, uh, uh, the incommensurability is known to scale with the doping at least up to 12% and then to somewhat saturate. Um, it's a short range uh, order, as I already mentioned, so 60 to 80 angstrom correlation lengths where, uh, where its amplitude and, and, uh, and the correlation lengths are maximized. And if you look along the C axis at the structure of the things, you see this broad structure here, uh, which the, the half width is, is basically almost, spans almost along the entire Brinwan uh, zone here, telling you that the it's mostly uncorrelated along the C-axis. So it's really a 2D order. Uh, the it appears below the T-star temperature, but uh, above the superconducting temperature, and competes with superconductivity. Uh, that I don't show it here. I will show it later. Uh, and and now just go to what happens when you put the field. So. Um, when you put the field, so the first to, 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 to figure this out, I mean, there was the quantum oscillation that, not, not that, that indicated that there was a, a reconstruction of the Fermi surface. Uh, but a uh, few years after, Marc Henri Julien found using uh, NMR, he observed this uh, splitting of the NMR line here uh, at, at high field, so field above uh, 15 Tesla, uh, and th that he attributed to uh, a long range uh, charge order. Uh, the group of uh, Cyril Proust and David Leboeuf then found out in, in the sound velocity a signature of a real thermodynamic phase transition above a field of roughly uh, 15, 16 Tesla uh, uh, at low temperature uh, towards also a static uh, charge order. And from the, uh, the X-ray uh, perspective, uh, the, the, the work of uh, Joanne Chong, where they found this charge and C wave uh, basically simultaneously uh, with diffraction when we were doing the RICS measurement. So this is the temperature dependence of the charge and C wave. You see it appears in the normal state. It's maximized at the superconducting TC and decreases in the superconducting state. And when you apply a magnetic field, you see that the charge and C wave peak is increased. But there's nothing here that looks like, uh, like a long range uh, order so the correlation length, the maximum correlation length is of the order of uh, 100 angstrom or something like that. So uh, it was a bit mysterious. And in a really uh, uh, incredible experiment, the group of Stanford they managed to make an uh, 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 X-ray diffraction experiment in a pulsed field at the free electron laser in uh, at uh, LCLS. So they used field up to 30 tesla, and they could actually find uh, that uh, uh, above a certain uh, above a certain field. Uh, there is now a sharp peak that appears uh, at L equal 1. And I will show you later. It corresponds to a long-range uh, uh, order. So if I plot a bit the situation in the, uh, in the OKL plan here, I have my gamma point. Uh, at, low oops, at low field, uh, I have the 2D wave vector. Huh? So it's almost a rod along the C-axis, but with some kind of doubling of the unit cell along the C-axis. And when I apply a alignment, high magnetic field, there is a very sharp bright reflection that appears here, at, uh, and it corresponds to a 3D order at L equal 1, but with the same in-plane incommensurability. So um, our, our approach to that was, OK, uh, so if we have a wave in the cupets, it must be interesting to look at the phonons, uh, because you know that in the, in the original 1D uh, case, so the, the Byers uh, the textbook uh, calculation, uh, you, you know that the uh, uh, 1D system is going to be unstable uh, uh, to the formation of a charge density wave uh, and it manifests itself by a softening of the phonon uh, at the nesting wave vector of the Fermi surface. But it strictly worked only in the 1D case uh, and if as long as you go uh, in higher uh, dimensions, so the, 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 the real part of the electronic susceptibility which has a, a clear maximum and actually a, a divergence in 1D, I mean, this maximum is completely washed out in higher dimension. Yet, in the materials that, uh, well, at the first, so this soft phonon have been measured, and starting with this was also the work uh, in Karlsruhe, and actually in, in, in our institute back in the 70s, where they measured using inelastic Newton scattering the first um, uh, uh, soft mode associated with uh, the formation of charge and C wave. Uh, and then, 
uh, this work was pursued. And in the 1D compound, you always see this kind of sharp anomaly in the phonon dispersion. So here, again, it's momentum energy. And you see that as, function of as you approach the, the, the structure instability, the, the mode softens and eventually really get completely soft. But it also happens in, in higher dimensions. So here in niobium disselenite, which is a 2D material, as we heard from Pierre Rodier, there's also this kind of uh, soft mode anomaly. So, uh, and our question was well out there, so, uh, phonon anomalies across the 2 d ring wave vector. So I'm just going to focus on that precise doping level where the charge order uh, is maximized, so, so it's close to 12% uh, in, in, in a YBCO compound. And uh, what we used is in elastic X-ray scattering. Uh, so that's basically conceptually very close to uh, an elastic neutron scattering. Uh, the big advantage being that we can work uh, with much smaller samples. Uh, and um, so what you have here is basically a monochromator, a, uh, a very high resolution monochromator because you have x-rays of, uh, of close to 20 kilo electron volt that you want to monochromatize down to a few milli electron volt. And here you get a spectrometer, which is just like a triple axis spectrometer. So you can change the position of the, of the spectrometer. So the analyzers are here and you can change the momentum transfer between the, the sample and the photons to, plug to probe the dispersion. Uh, the, the typical kind of excitation you can look at are, uh, are schematized here, and we are mostly going to look at the phonons. Uh, and there is also uh, a very interesting upgrade of that kind of beamline now at the SRF, which is a, a, a diffuse uh, X-ray scattering site station that allow you to make a mapping of the reciprocal space ahead of the experiment. So. To explain you this a bit better, so first, this is typical uh, phonon measurement. Um, what you see, so when what you do, you, you place yourself at a given momentum uh, in the reciprocal space, at, at, the at a place somewhere at the, the in the path that you choose in the reciprocal space, and you scan the energy um, with X-ray. I mean, you can't you can't just do momentum scan with X-ray so easily as, as easily as with neutrons, and the typical spectrums are like that. Uh, so you get the, uh, the elastic line at zero energy loss, and then you get some phonon lines that you can compare directly uh, with uh, first principle calculation and map out the dispersion of the phonons by measuring this kind of things at different, different keys. Um, okay, so the question is really, I mean, you have in YBCO, you have uh, YBCO7, you have 13 atoms, it gives you 39 phonon branches. And uh, you're not going to study these 39 phonon branches one after the other to find out where, uh, uh, which phonon is might be uh, eventually anomalous. So the, the trick here, uh, normally when you know which phonon you want to look at, you calculate the structure factor and you find out which is the best Prelorenzo to work. Uh, here we did the opposite. Uh, we uh, took a map of the reciprocal space using diffuse scattering at room temperature and then at 90 K. And you see that at 90 K, we saw satellites coming here that corresponds to the charge density wave. Okay, so these are really the 2D charge density wave, and the idea was that we just go where these satellites are the strongest, and this is where we have the, the highest chances to see phonon anomalies. So this is really like a, uh, like a treasure map, huh, you say, that tells you where to look uh, uh, in, the, in the reciprocal space. Uh, and actually, this kind of map, I, mean, I, I really find this quite remarkable because this is basically a 10-minute experiment. And uh, yet it took uh, 30 years to observe the Charlton C wave. It's a bit more subtle than that. You really had to get the, the, the latest generation of detectors, noise-free, and a very high dynamical range because you have uh, six to eight orders of magnitude difference in intensities between the Bragg reflection and the, c and the CDW satellite. But uh, now it exists, it works, and it's very, very useful. So we worked, we placed ourselves here in the reciprocal space, and we are going to just scan between that set point here at 6.5 and, uh, and across the 2D wave vector. So the first thing that we see uh, uh, when you we cool down in the CDW state is a, is a big enhancement of the, uh, of the elastic line. Okay, so if I plot the elastic line intensity as function of momentum, I see a peak. Okay, so that's basically uh, a, a, a highly static signature uh, of uh, our CDW. It shows us that the signal that we see in the, in the diffuse scattering is mostly uh, elastic and therefore uh, static. That's what we call the central peak. It's well known from classical transition and basically tells us that we are dealing with some kind of uh, either pin domain or slow, slowly fluctuating uh, domain. The second interesting signature is when I look at the phonons in the normal state, uh, 
they broaden. And that's, that's very anomalous. I mean, and, and this is a very big broadening. So I have a phonon mode at low energy here, okay, close to 8 milli electron volt. And if I look at its line width, I find that the line width broadens by almost a factor of two, uh, even more actually, so up to four MeV uh, line widths, but just at the Q2D wave vector. Okay, and when I go in the superconducting state, this uh, broadening completely disappears. Um, so that's that's anomalous from broadening. So that's my second signature uh, of the TW in the uh, in the axis spectrum. And the third one is when I go to in the superconducting state, I see a sharp phonon softening. It's actually a very decent softening. It's a 15% to 20% of the phonon frequency. It's a big effect. When you do phonon spectroscopy, it's basically boring. You know, you see nothing happening. And when you see this kind of big softening, you're surprised. And it looks very much like this phone anomalies that we had in the classical charge density wave, except that now it's induced by superconductivity. And it just never goes to zero, so it, it doesn't doesn't look like a soft mode driven uh, 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 charge density a la Pires. Okay. So now I'm going to use these three uh, uh, signatures of the CW to try to study the interplay between the charge density wave and superconductivity using pressure. So we first start with hydrostatic pressure, um, and uh, it's well known that uh, the, the, the 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 critical temperature dependence of YBCO strongly depends on the, on the pressure and, and it's very different uh, depending on the doping. At the doping where we are, this is the red curve here, you get a, a fairly decent increase, I mean from 65K up to 100K at, uh, at, uh, at 10 GPA of the critical temperature. So this is a very big increase. So this uh, doping is very sensitive to pressure. And funnily enough, uh, this was noticed by, uh, by the group of Louis Taifer, the DTC over DP uh, almost uh, corresponds to the DTC over DH, except that the magnetic field is suppressing superconductivity and the pressure is increasing superconductivity. So what we did is that we used uh, the cryostat that they had at the SRF and that they had developed, so we, we can put a diamond anvil cell uh, at, at low temperature in elastic X-ray scattering, pressure up to, uh, in principle, up to 100 GPA. Uh, and, uh, and our idea was to track and how the charge density wave behaves uh, uh, under uh, high pressure at low temperature. And uh, first, uh, the elastic line that we see here at low pressure, the enhancement is completely suppressed. Second and third, the uh, line width, so the, 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 the CW normal state broadening of the phonon is suppressed with very modest pressure, I mean, at, at, at one gig gigapascal, which is actually an annoy annoyingly small pressure to work in the diamond and cell. But at one gigapascal, uh, the signature, the, the normal mode, so the, the normal state broadening of the mode is completely gone, and the cone anomaly in the superconducting state is gone as well. So all the three uh, features that we had seen uh, uh, that are the central peak, the normal state burning, the superconductivity induced softening, that all the three signatures of the charge density wave in inelastic X-ray scattering are completely gone uh, by one, one gigapascal. And I'm not going to discuss that too much, but uh, we could check that the pressure induced uh, uh, doping uh, uh, effect are cannot explain this. Okay, so basically. Uh, there was at some point a uh, tentative of explanation that the very large uh, increase of TC, the DTC over DP that was seen, could be explained by the competition between the charge density wave and superconductivity, but I think it's obvious because really the charge density wave is extremely fragile uh, when you apply pressure. So there must be other explanation for that, and one probably needs to look in detail finally after 30 years what happens to the crystalline structure when you, do when you apply pressure. I'm not going to uh, spend more time on the uh, hydrostatic pressure because in the end, what I'm just saying is that, well, if you apply a magnetic field to suppress superconductivity, you enhance the charge density wave. And if you uh, use pressure now, well, you increase superconductivity and you suppress charge density wave. Okay, so maybe a bit faster uh, than what you had expected, but in the end, it's not such a surprising result. Now, the question we ask ourselves is now, what if we could suppress superconductivity with pressure? And so how do we do that? Well, it's been known for actually quite some time or so, uh, that's okay, that the uh, 
in the cuprate, the uh, uh, critical temperature strongly depends on uh, is and how that said, has a much stronger um, uh, dependence uh, to uh, uni actual pressure than to hydrostatic pressure. So this was found in a whole series of cuprates. And actually, there was a lot of work done also in Karlsruhe. And I think some of these earlier uh, seminar results, and the first time it was observed, was the PhD uh, of Christoph Meingast. But this was all done in the very low pressure limit. Okay, in the but it, it was quite clear that uh, the pressure dependence that you see, uh, so the whatever the, the hydrostatic response of that material to but the response of the, the critical temperature of that material to hydrostatic pressure is a clear compromise between antagonistic effect of uh, unique pressures uh, that, that, that just have uh, opposite effects. So along the C-axis decrease Tc and in the plane increases Tc. So the uh, and I thought it would be much more interesting to look at what happens when you apply uniaxial pressure uh, in a controlled way. And that pretty much when this idea uh, emerged or started to bloom in my head, uh, the group of, uh, of Andy McKenzie developed this piezoelectric based uh, 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 apparatus to apply a relatively large strain. Uh, so they studied here, for instance, strontium lutenate. They could uh, uh, double the critical TC and multiply the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the HC2 by a factor of 20 uh, using a uniaxial stress uh, on their sample. So what we did is basically that uh, we started working with them and uh, the, the thing is that they are doing mostly uh, transport and magnetization measurement and what we need is to get the photon in and the photon out. So it took us some time to find a way to do that uh, and because we are lazy, I mean I'm, I'm personally a bit lazy, uh, my the, the easiest way to proceed is instead of making a completely new cryostat was to use the, the high pressure cryostat we had at the SRF. Um, and to actually have the time here, I have eight minutes left. Yeah, yeah. Well, you started late, so. <laughs> so, um, so we apply. So we made this this basically pressure cell with a sample in the center of rotation, uh, and and then we could make a needle and start doing an elastic X-ray scattering. So, uh, we could check that indeed when we apply pressure along the A-axis, now we suppress superconductivity, which is what we wanted to do. And now we start looking at what we do to uh, our charge density wave once here. So here's my cone anomaly in the absence of pressure. And if I apply uniaxial pressure, you see that there is a clear enhancement of the elastic line. I mean, the, the intensity almost doubled with 1% compression. Uh, and if I look at this, this color map here, you see that there is some extra spectral weight. So first thought that the softening was somewhat enhanced. But what we found out is actually is, a, is another mode that is getting softer. Okay, so um, now uh, we we pushed as much as we could, and this peak was growing, but still we had no signature of long-range uh, order. And then came the idea: say, well, maybe it's just like the magnetic field. So let's have a look at what happens at the L equal one in the at, at the at the three D wave vector. And this is now a scan along the L direction here. Uh, no, sorry, the, the a scan like this. So the red curve is in the absence of strain, and you see this broad peak that corresponds to the 2D uh, charge density wave. And when we apply strain, now we get this peak that appeared at 1% compression. I mean, it started there at 0.8%, and then it really shoots up 1% compression. So we were very excited with that. Um, and uh, so that's a scan along the L direction. That's a scan along the K direction. And what we got here is actually our actually very sharp peak, and the the in-plane correlation length is of the order of 350 angstrom, so it's very long, long as the longest uh, correlation length that you see in striped order cuprate. And it's really a 3D long-range charge order that we induce. Uh, and uh, I compare that with what is seen in the magnetic field here. So you can see that this is quite a, it's a, it's a nice uh, big effect that we can obtain with uniaxial pressure. And even better, uh, this is seen at 50k, whereas this is seen at 22k. Eh? So uh, here you really need to suppress superconductivity. And here we can then use this already in the normal state. So we investigated a bit more ups, the, uh, the temperature dependence. So we could not go to very high temperature, unfortunately. Uh, but basically at 70k, which means above the nominal critical temperature of the sample, we can already induce the 3D orders. It means we can really go from the 2D to the 3D order just using any actual pressure. Uh, and what we see is that the peak is maximized at 50k and then decreases and ended up 
completely disappearing the superconductivity. That means that the, the competition now uh, with superconductivity is also very, very strong because of this, the, so this is the, the, uh, the intensity versus temperature. So at low temperatures, it really goes. I mean, we cannot detect it anymore. Uh, and, uh, and it really shoots up at the TC of the sample, which again is consistent with the magnetic field data. But now, instead of suppressing completely superconductivity and inducing the peak at low temperature, we can suppress it a bit and induce the long range order much stronger. And the plum on the cake. Uh, is that because we did inelastic extra scattering, we can also look at the phonons. Um, and what we discovered doing the scan along this, uh, this, this L equal 1 direction here at the 3D wave vector is that the cone anomaly in the superconducting state that we had noticed earlier for the 2D Chernancy wave actually already exists. So here I compare the phonon spectrum with the ab initial calculation. So you see a deviation here in that region at the, at the, at the, at the, at the 3D Q wave vector here. And when I now apply strain, uh, what I find uh, is basically uh, that the acoustic mode that experienced this, this small anomaly uh, falls back onto where it was supposed to disperse. Uh, but there's another mode, the one I mentioned earlier, that softens. So it must be an, 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 an optical mode that is basically getting completely soft uh, uh, and associated with the formation of the, of the 3D charge order. So that's basically the temperature dependence here. I had to add a second line because the referee said, well, you know, it could get completely soft, but it could also just uh, uh, monotically uh, uh, harden across the 3D wave vector. Well, I cannot prove the contrary, uh, but I'm very convinced it's a complete softening of the mode, which is associated with the formation of the long range charge order. And to finish, I, I cannot identify that mode, but I can identify the symmetry. And I know it has basically the symmetry of uh, uh, the so-called uh, bond stretching mode, uh, which is a high energy phonon uh, that has a pattern that matches that of the, uh, of the stripes and that was known for years uh, to display a very anomalous behavior and a strong uh, something. So here there's a bit more in the speculative part, but what we suspect is that with this uniaxial pressure, we can actually drive that mode and uh, to hybridize with the modes with the same symmetry uh, lower and to drive this to a complete to, to complete softening uh, yielding to the formation of the of the 3D order. So just summarizing here my result and I'm just going to stop here. He's our chairman and thank you for your <laughs> attention. <laughs>